and hear the questions. Uh, so we're all gonna make an effort to speak as loudly as we possibly can. So without further ado, unless I've missed something, Dr. Rodenovic. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Um, Cliff has asked to move that to the end. I'm gonna uh, walk to the other side and the presentation. So if I can ask um, everybody on boards to please turn your chairs around and face this way. That's where the swings are. I believe everybody in the boards has a presentation. There isn't, if you don't have one, I will make sure we get them to you. We're not mic'd. We um, don't have enough mics. Yeah, but that's for the TV. I will try to use my lunchroom voice. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to welcome people here. I want to apologize for my back that you could be seeing during most of the presentation. I'll be concentrating on the slides and the data before you, um, so I apologize for that. And if I make a mistake with our pointer, um, I'm sure somebody will correct me. All right. First of all, I'd like to talk about the timetable. Um, in October, end of October, all of the principals and directors were given a set of instructions by me to put together a budget that was level service. So whatever we were doing today, we would be able to do next year. I said the only things they could add were things that would close the achievement gap. And that will keep coming up throughout my presentation that any of the new things that our programs or new staff are only about closing the achievement gap. In December, we had the site managers, the principals, directors come into the office, meet with a member of the school board um, and myself and Mrs. Miranda to talk about what their numbers are, um, to vet those numbers to make sure they were correct. We then had an all-day budget review before with uh, members of the FinCom. I believe four or five members of the FinCom were present, two members of the school board, and they basically got the exact same thing you're going to be seeing today. Last Wednesday, that same presentation was given to the Wareham School Board for them to see it, and then tonight for the public to see it. And on the 26th is when the school board will vote on the budget number to recommend to the town administrator, which will go up on February 1st. There are three things that I'm going to try to communicate today. One is the money we have requested is needed to close the achievement gap. The second is that Wareham has been funded below the state average spending for many years, and then I'll explain where each of the dollars are gonna go. In front of you, depending on whether you can uh, see the colors or not, I better put my glasses on because some of the numbers are small up there. Um, the purple line is the state average in English language arts and achievement. So if we take all of the children in the state who have taken the MCAS in English language arts <coughs> and we take their <coughs> average, that is the average score through the state. If you then look at the blue line, we see where Wareham is. And there is a gap. There have been some years where it's been narrowed and some years where it has increased, but the gap remains. The red line is, is mathematics. The red line is the state. Goldenrod or yellow is Wareham. 
there is even a larger gap in the achievement. Yes, we are going in the right direction, but so isn't the state, and the gap remains. That is not acceptable, and therefore, we need to do something different. How do we eliminate the achievement gap? I have three programs that I'm talking about tonight <coughs> that I believe will eliminate the gap in achievement. The first is response to intervention. I will try to put it in simple terms. There will be a probably a 45 minute to an hour presentation before the school board on a given night. It will be on the agenda so you'll be able to go, but with the timeliness of this, I don't want to give you that much information. But the bottom line is, when your child is being instructed in an elementary classroom, and if they don't get the concept in the curriculum, Sometimes we don't know that and we don't remediate it until it's too late. The idea is teachers will be doing assessments throughout the instructional period. We'll find out when students haven't mastered that curriculum. And there will be a new staff member <coughs> called an interventionist who will be available to work with that youngster to remediate them before they have to go to remedial classes. If you believe the literature and the um, research that has been done, this is expensive to begin with, but it pays dividends. Wareham now has close to 20% of our student population in special education. That has grown from approximately 14%. Districts that have put in a response to intervention, after three or four years, that number begins to go down. So that from that 20, we should be able to get back down to 15, which is the state average. So it should pay for itself in time because of special education teachers have a smaller load of students then they will be able to be the interventionists. But right now we need to do both. Enhanced supervision and instructional leadership. For the last year and a half, the Wareham Education <coughs> Association, a member of the school board, and administrators have been sitting down discussing supervision and evaluation. If you've been following all the talk about RTT, Race to the Top, you've heard that one component of it is to begin to use assessment data, how our children do daily, and when we are looking at how do we evaluate personnel. In order to do that, you can't have the model that we currently have. In an elementary school, you have one principal, one vice principal, and you have a staff of 50. And most people know if you go to look for the assistant principal, they're at lunch duty, they're at bus duty, they're handling discipline issues, they're handling parent calls. So who is going to be in those classrooms daily to make sure that the instructional practices that we're going to be implementing with RTI are happening. The only way to have that is to have additional instructional leaders to perform additional supervision <coughs> and observations. I'm sorry. <coughs> implementing mass core curriculum at Wareham High School. The federal government has decided that there needs to be more rigor in high school preparation, that all students have to have four years of math. All students must have three years of a lab science. And then they have a grouping of additional courses 
where they have to take approximately 10 hours of these additional courses. The only way we're going to be able to implement that is with additional staff. Now, spending alone doesn't increase achievement, but when the gap in spending mirrors the gap in achievement, then we can't keep doing things the way we've always done them. Before you, when these are small numbers, you'll see it in the chart, it should make more sense. 1993, I just didn't choose that number. That was the beginning of educational reform in Massachusetts. That's when the idea of a minimum amount of money being spent in a school system came about. So in 1993, everybody started equal. There's no track record. But after that, you can see how much was spent above that minimum net spending amount or how much below. 94 minus 2.7. Below for Wayham, 2.6 above for the state. You notice the state, it keeps growing. We hit difficult economic times. We were at 14, we were at 16, well, we're now back to 14. That's if we take all of the districts in Massachusetts and we average their spending above or below minimum net spending, the average is 14.6% above the minimum net spending. Last year in Wayham, on 210, we were at 2% above. We also have the differences between them, and you can see the differences continue to grow. That same data showed on a chart shows how the state minimum net spending, average spending, has continued to rise until we hit this point now we've come down because of the tough economic times. <coughs> and here we are below the number, but starting in approximately 207, we have been above minimum net spending. In seven, eight, nine, and 10. However, the gap is still there. And it is a large gap. So these are fiscal 8, 9, and 10. Take all the districts and say what did they spend. We have <coughs> in this year, or excuse me, last fiscal year 10, we 150 districts spent above 120%. 116 districts spent between 105 and 120 percent above minimum net. <coughs> Wareham is right here and we have been here for the last three years and the average for us is 102 percent. So we've been two percent above minimum net over the last three years. So 266 districts have spent more than we have on education, above minimum net. And 14, 20, 21 have spent below where we have been spending. If we have those dollars, so if you take the required net school spending and you take the average that the state and you go like in fiscal 10, 1.146 times the 29,651, 135, you come up with the 32 million 438,342, which is $2,787,000 extra we would have had if we were spending at the state average above minimum net spending. Not at the 20 or the 50% above, 
but at the state average. Where is the money going? <coughs> the entire budget is broken into seven major categories that go to make up net school spending. And I apologize the numbers aren't that large, but the majority of the money <coughs> mirrors it all. Instructional services, which is the 2,000 accounts, is where $1,663,000 is. We go down to payments to other districts, $359,829. You add those two up and you come almost to that number. There are a few others that have gone up slightly. But those are the two areas where the budget has grown the most. And where else should it go up but instructional services? If we take a look at the pie chart that shows the same information, 77% instructional services. If we then add to that 7%, which is here, which is payments to other districts, now we're at 84%, and then we add another 10%, is this one right here, now we're at 94% in three areas. So we have heat, light, storage, water, right there, <coughs> structural services, payments to other districts. Those are the largest parts of our budget. Why the large increase this year in comparison to the budget the year before? Well, it was a good thing, we thought. The federal government came up with stimulus money, to, and they said, save jobs, create jobs. I don't think anybody three years ago would have thought that it would take them this long for the economy to recover. But it has. So we have, in our budget, $745,000 worth of positions that have been paid for by federal grants. They're all gone. And I do not believe we're going to get any more. We have added instructional leaders that additional supervision for observation and coaching, $267,000. Contractual obligations, $517,000. Increase in textbooks, $154,000. And special education tuitions for private schools increase of $368,935. That's why the big increase in that 2,000 accounts or that $1,600,000. These are the grants and the positions that they paid for. And just because those grants are gone doesn't mean that we don't need the positions that they paid for. We have the edu jobs that we spent 295,698 for 5.31 positions. Arrow money that came through the state to the district, SFSF it's called, four positions for 207,000. <coughs> Title I, ARA, 14,545. ARA IDEA, 227,906. Together, that's what adds up to 745,476. And the positions are approximately 15 positions that this grant money was used to support. When we go to that first line, the 1,000 accounts, <coughs> school committee, superintendent, business office, tech office, we look at the totals, it's a minus. Instructional leadership, 
Now I'm, the next four or five slides are all on the 2,000 accounts, which comes under instruction. The largest um, difference in this particular one is this $33,000. That's for increases in instructional and assessment material mandated by the state because we have schools in need of improvement. Continuing with the 2000 accounts, 2250 building tech para salaries is an additional half of a para professional for the high school in this account. <coughs> Um, 2305, which is the largest number, that is classroom teachers. That's where we had a backfill money lost from federal grants and contractual obligations. And the instructional leaders that I talked about, right here. Do we pay our teachers too much? The answer is no. We start bachelor step one in Wareham, 37,466. If you happen to go to Bullen for the interview, they offer 42,544. Most beginning teachers, given the option of an additional four or five thousand dollars just down the road, where are they going to go? Now, 30 years later, you have a master's degree and 30 years of experience, and yeah, we're right with everybody else. Something has to be done with this so that we remain competitive with the other communities around us, so that we can get the best and brightest. <coughs> this shows the same information in a chart. Here's where him. We have one other community that's a little bit above us. Why did I choose these? Because they're around us. Continuing with the instruction. 2330, contractual obligation, new position for autism spectrum disorder that we needed another paraprofessional for a new classroom that we opened up in middle school and because of grant reductions. Some of our grants also paid for paraprofessionals and now they're not any longer. Continuing with 2000, we have additional textbooks. We have consumable material with the new math series that we have, the children get to write in their books, in their consumable books. It does help them learn instead of going to the copy machine and breaking copyright law and copying. Hardware, tech, um, believe me, that is a very small number. If we went and try to replace all of the technology in the schools, we're talking a million dollars. Over a four year plan, $250,000 a year. Um, this just does one school, um, some technology. It's nowhere enough. The hope that we really have is that if we can get on the state building list and have our two elementary <coughs> schools renovated and expanded, and we will get new technology like we got here at the middle school <coughs> when this project was done. Three thousand accounts, student services, attendance, athletics, other student activities, very small increase. <coughs> Custodial, heating, utilities, grounds. Um, there is something that has been useful to us is having an energy manager, somebody to remind people about shutting off all of the computers before long weekends, 
shutting off the heat, keeping uh, these lights to keep going off was one of his ideas. Um, but, you know, to save energy where we can, cost avoidance, um, and system software solutions previously paid for from grants in 4400 um, which is $36,000. Retirement student insurance basically have been the same all the time. And leases, these are all the copying machines, the Rizzo machines. Um, those are the leases, we pay for those. And uh, the good news is when we get a new lease for the first couple of years, we don't have to pay maintenance on them. Um, and so we do keep moving them. And they get an awful lot of people, the machines are not made to be used by the number of people who use them in the schools. Tuition. Um, Bristol Agricultural, we have approximately 12 children who go to Bristol Agricultural School. That's because they want a program that is not offered at Upper Cape or Wareham High School. Tuition is approximately $18,000 a year. That comes right out of our next school spending budget. That we budgeted 162,423 for next year. Um, this is the largest increase right here, and this is because even though the state may say, you're not going to get an increase, we're having hard times, we can't give you any more money, but when private day schools, the special education come before the state and ask for an increase, the average increase over the last three years has been 7%. That's why that number has to go up. On non-net school spending. The last two years, we've been at these numbers, so this is the non-net. It's these two accounts together. And so, 1,467915. This year we're requesting 1,490268 or a $22,000 increase or 1.5. If we look at the next slide, you will see that the average increase over six years in the transportation or non net school spending has been zero. You take the negative 3% in 07 and you move it across, a negative two, do the math, zero. The budget that I am here before presenting to all of the boards, next school spending, 27 million, 91,413 dollars. Non-net school spending, 1 million, 490,200 and 68,000. Combined, 28,581,681 dollars are a 7.8% increase over last year. The comparison between 11 and 12 is made much more difficult because of the grant money that has been lost. Because of the additional edu jobs money that created new positions and the loss of the federal stimulus money. Again, I want to remind you to decrease the achievement gap, we need to decrease the spending gap. Minimum net spending is not adequate spending. The formula that derives minimum net spending hasn't changed since 1993. Look at your household budgets. Health care and health insurance is one of the things that go into making up minimum net spending. That has not increased since 93. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you, Dr. Bennett.
We have three sets of partners here tonight, the way I look at it. Um, the school committee has worked very hard um, on this presentation and, and the recommendations that Dr. Rabinovich has made. We've got the board of selectmen who understand the fiscal uh, <coughs> condition of the board, and we've got the finance committee. The only, the only entity that is not here tonight to help us solve some of these problems that we're facing in terms of fiscal constraint is the governor. A week from tonight, the governor will submit his budget. He will either then tell us at that point in time, or the legislature, the House and Senate, what they intend to do with the largest pool of dollars that comes into the school district, Chapter 70. It's the law. And the law says that the school department gets these dollars. It used to be about 13 and a half, 14 million dollars. It's down to 12.1 million dollars. We need to work as a team to solve these fiscal issues. And if I could bring what we have facing us, and we did this on purpose because I think not only is Chapter 70 going to be on the table for, uh, for chopping uh, blocks, if you will, uh, that the unrestricted <coughs> local aid to the town will be cut. We cannot operate at a deficit. If you don't, if you spend more than you make during the fiscal year, you're going to wind up in a situation where the state's going to take the money back at recap time, which we just finished. We just set the tax rate. Uh, for the first time in several years, on time, tax bills are out. And guess what? Every person in this room that pays their taxes is paying the, the absolute levy limit amount, two and one half percent. With new growth, that comes out to be about a million dollars. So we're not pulling any punches here. We're bringing our revenue down locally to say that we have uh, leveled that up. We have building permits and health permits that, that have increased because of, I think, a very aggressive approach in those departments. Uh, we've, we've brought our revenue down, down by 2% for fiscal 2011. We have, our expenditures have gone up by 3%. Why is that? We haven't settled our collective bargaining agreements. We had outstanding contracts for 11 units when I arrived about a year ago. They have not been settled. That's a liability. We're going to have to pay it at some point in time. We've solved, as you'll see in a couple of minutes, solved that problem. <coughs> that 3% adjustment in the lines means that every town department has been level funded at no increase going forward. We're also looking at funding pension and something called post-employment benefits going forward that we are responsible for as a town. Uh, we settled five out of 11 contracts uh, which have been overdue just to get caught up. This isn't like, uh, I talked with the superintendent earlier tonight, it's a bargaining year this year, Mr. Superintendent, for next year? Uh, that's correct. Okay, we're not even caught up to that point. So the challenge to our leadership team is to try to look at what they're doing, try to look at it and to work strategically. We had the Department of Revenue in, in and they said that we had 42 findings which touched, which touched every single department in town. No one department did, did any better than any other department. We've got to get this fiscal stability worked out. We had 91% completed at the beginning part of December. I intend to solve that hopefully between now and the first week in February. We've looked at putting resources in where they told us we needed resources, in the accounting department, in the planning department, and in the town administrator's office, part-time position, to basically get us up to speed as we work with all of the departments to solve the 42 findings by the Mass Department of Revenue. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a couple of the municipal laborers? You're out there, I'm still getting calls about ice and snow build up in neighborhoods and in front of various houses. We need to build up that department or find some way to get the street safe. And that's the first time in about a decade. We've maintained our lifeguard program, which has brought people back to the top beaches for the first time in a long time. Our independent auditors continue to assist us in gaining fiscal stability. 
We have maintained a positive free cash position. What does that mean? At the end of the day, when we paid all of our bills, we had some money left over. For positions that were not filled, or positions that didn't get filled at a particular time, or we had basically brought in additional revenues during the fiscal year. We try to once again solve some of that money away in our stabilization fund. About a decade ago, we had about a million six hundred thousand dollars in that account, and we've been trying to put it back each year. Last year, we, we put it in a hundred thousand dollars. This year, we have budgeted one hundred fifty thousand dollars. We try to use new technology and student interns to help us get the best thing for our buck in terms of operations. And we've also upgraded our financial management information system. Um, so we've increased our reserves. My goal is to put the money back into the rainy day fund over time. <coughs> it didn't all come out at one time. It's going to go back in in some orderly fashion. This. On the capital side, we need this equipment in our ambulance service. It's absolutely horrendous. Come down to the EMS and drive around in the oldest vehicle. <coughs> Tell me what you see. <coughs> We need to get on a program, which we started last year, to replace the equipment in the police department, including loose cru cruisers and one command vehicle, and to fit, stay on a program where we're replacing some of our aged cruisers and equipment. We need to replace some of the infrastructure uh, in terms of our pump stations uh, and some of the equipment that would go with that in the enterprise fund. And we need, need to make, I think, the hallmark of our town, town hall, a place that you can visit, that's clean, and it's effective in terms of how we operate, and people would actually use it as a show place as some other town halls out in the region. This, the dollar bill always works because we all, we all have it in our wallets. Where does the money come from? 23% of the state aid comes from the state. 54% comes from the tax revenue. But at the levy limit, we can't go any further to make any more revenue coming at the local level. 10% comes from the Enterprise Fund, water treatment facility. 8% comes from local receipts, the departments that I mentioned. And 4% comes from other financing sources. Where does the money go to? And 1% comes from the federal revenue programs that uh, make up the, the budget at this time. Where does it go to? 8% to public safety. Proud to say that we put six additional probation area officers on board to build up our police department to where it should be. 5% goes to Cherry Sheet uh, debt uh, uh, offsets. 46% of your dollar goes to education, and it should. Four percent goes to the, uh, the vocational school. Ten percent goes to the enterprise fund that is now in balance. Eleven percent goes to employee benefits. Make no mistake about it, because it was on the presentation that, that Dr. Rabinovich took over. We pay up front all of the benefits for all the employees in town. Then at the end of the day, we figure out what the charge back to the town will be. And that amounts to be off of the balance sheet about $8 million when you figure it out. 3% go to municipal maintenance, 4% for general government, 4% for the pension system, which is down this year, 2% for debt service, 2% for uh, the culture and uh, council on aging. 1% for liability insurance and reserves. And uh, physical bathroom speakers. So the numbers that won't change on the balance sheet going forward that haven't been changed since the early 90s, Barry, right? That we're paying up front are right here. And as new employees fill all the slots, if we have that ability to do that, we're picking up a 1.45% of their Medicare costs, additional health care costs that build up over time, and it's built into the upfront package. The town <coughs> funds this money so that all of the employees, teachers, municipal maintenance workers, 
Uh, the people that are out shoveling the streets are covered by this, uh, this, this type of program. <coughs> and I want to thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Sylvie, to present. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this particular time, I'd like to allow the uh, Finance Committee uh, a half an hour, or like I said before, there's no stopwatch, so Chairman Bronx, First of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Thank you, Dr. Rabinovich. Thank you, uh, Mark Andrews. And it's, it, I think it's a real sign of the times that we're all three coming together to work together. And as a community, we're in this situation together. And we have to realize that our children are our biggest resources. I, th I think everyone here would 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 confer with that, that our children are the assets to our community. So we want to continue to work with the school department and try to get um, the, the town and the school department to get more realistic um, numbers for retirements and looking at maybe when they hire new folks, if they can hire them, if there's a way that they can hire them under a different uh, pay schedule, meaning the benefit schedule. We're exploring all these avenues, but in, in no way do any of us want to see the quality of the education go down. We want to see it continue to grow. And um, the former chairman, Mr. Paulson, has done a lot of work with the school committee, so I'm going to turn, turn the speaker over to Mr. Paulson at this time. You can do it, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's on my channel. Thank you. Um, I guess one question I have is just looking forward, and again, looking at the uh, results uh, that Jerry showed up on the screen as the states ended with their election and ours was parallel with it. Uh, what occurs to me is the other towns are probably going to be doing the same thing that we're attempting to do. So they're going to be trying to improve as we're trying to improve. And, and I see the, uh, and I understand the desirability of uh, trying to uh, intervene, if you will. But I'm wondering how we're going to measure that going out three or four years, and put, a little, put it a little differently. If three or four years from now, we've still got that same gap, would somebody say, well, gee, we haven't done the job we're supposed to do? Or alternatively, and positively, if we do narrow the gap, can we reward the people and the, and the uh, school department for, for narrowing that gap? And so my question really is, how do we go about trying to set a goal out again several years and then see how we measure or how we measure up to that uh, uh, goal over a period of time <laughs> and not wait for four years, but to look at how we're doing a year out, two years out, three years out. So. That would really be my uh, my observation and question. Is that a question? Yes. You, it is a question. You want to address it to anyone particularly, or no? It's just general. a general. It's a general observation and a, and mm -hmm. a, and a question. Dr. Yes. Um, I don't like to use too many uh, letters, but I'm going to have to. Um, the whole idea of why we give MCAS tests every year. And the reason why there's a state average is because of NCLB, which is federal law. And federal law says by 214, we need to reach a level of proficiency. And they measure us every year against that standard. So when we do our report cards and we send it home to all of the parents, we have it on our website, it's called the report card, and it shows each of the schools where their improvement needs to be and where they've come in and then they come before the school board and their improvement plans they talk about those numbers they say why they met them or didn't meet them and what they're going to change every year we try to do things differently and smarter so that the measurement will be when we get 
to state average or above state average. That's going to be, and that's what I want to see, Dick, within four years. I want to see us above the state average. Dr. Rasmussen, I'll ask you. Another way, I mean, it's similar. Um, another way, and I think Bob can speak to this a little bit more, um, is that um, the school committee um, took a look this year at the existing school improvement plans um, and the format um, that was being used. And um, this year, and definitely going into next year, uh, the format that's going to be used are, is around SMART goals. So that you're not only putting your goal, but you're also putting your actions behind them. Um, and then also how you're going to measure them by. So each school will be coming in front of us um, talking about their SMART goals and how they're going to be measured based on the criteria that's set. Um, what was added to the form this year was also benchmarks, so things like attendance. So all of the data from the prior year is added to that format, so then every single year we're taking a look at that. So not only are we um, are we looked at from a state level, but we're also looking at it from a community level, and we've asked on a quarterly basis that, um, that the schools do come in, and we've already had a couple presentations already, coming in and um, giving uh, updates to those goals and where they are at this time. transit population that Wareham has supports and you see a high dropout rate in our, our in our system but it, it really isn't a dropout rate now I, I'd like you to explain that Dr. Sylvia uh, you want me to explain uh, it? anyone okay. um, believe it or not the uh, dropout rate in Wareham has been has been slowly but surely um, being lowered. Um, but yes, the, the transient population is a problem because uh, in many cases we don't even know uh, where they go. And so they're still being carried on our books and, and when, they, when they don't take a test and weigh in because we don't know where they are, that goes down in the state as a zero. So we're doing, we're working very, very hard and although the administrators are working very, very hard um, to know where the kids are and, and where they're going and to know if they're transferring to another school, what school they're going to. I didn't know whether... Um, no, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, I think you've, you've answered it. I mean, um, yes, we have a number of foster children in the district, um, but we treat them as our own. Um, you know, other communities do. We do have um, a fair number. We do have some homeless um, families because of some of the um, motels in town. Um, and does it add to the costs? Yes. And at one year when the state was flush, they actually um, reimbursed us and uh, with a rather large number for a year. In fact, it allowed us to hire a social worker to help serve that um, group of people better. Unfortunately, that money has disappeared. Um, but the need is still there for the services. And I think that I, I think there's anyone in this room would tell you, anyone um, observer or parent or uh, anyone else or anyone up, up here, if the state would only fund their mandates, we would be in the problem we're in right now. And I, and I know that that's, that's said over and over and over again, but at some point in time, the state was paying for special needs transportation, they cut that out. They, w they, they were paying for a certain percentage of out of district placements and they've, they've slowly but surely reduced that amount of money. So, um, you know, and that all adds up. Donna, back to your side. I think Dick has a question. I'd like to, uh, to ask another question. And, and uh, looking at the graphs that, that Barry uh, provided, and I might say that the uh, presentation I thought was very well done, as was the town administrators. It was very helpful. One of the things I'm curious about, you talked, Barry, about the, the salary what I call the salary gap. And uh, younger teachers, or say new teachers, but probably younger teachers, are at a different and lower level versus some surrounding towns. And yet when you go out on the, uh, on the uh, time spectrum, the uh, uh, salaries kind of uh, go up to, so that they're comparable, as you, as you commented. 
And then Donna mentioned uh, that maybe, or suggested that perhaps we should do something a little bit differently. And what occurs to me, and I realize that this would have to be handled through, through contracts, but what occurs to me is that perhaps we might consider, and maybe we have considered, doing this a little differently and turning the, uh, the equation around pay the new teachers a lot more than our competition, if you will, and then uh, make sure that at the other end of the spectrum that the salaries, instead of being comparable to the, uh, uh, the surrounding towns, are materially lower so that a young teacher would come into town, it, it's a question, because they could make more here, but they know that they're not going to stick around because they're not going to make as much out 15 years from now, and that what we're then doing is accomplishing what I think Donna was driving at, and that is to get younger blood coming into the system continually, because you're paying more at the outset. In other words, turn that, not turn the graph around, but turn the numbers around, if, if that's fairly clear. Uh, and that that's a question as to whether we've considered it. Again, I understand the complexities of, of, the, of the contracts, and probably a lot of teachers wait, uh, uh, waiting outside with a noose, but they're outside. <laughs> <laughs> no noose. No. Um, Dr. Benovich? Mr. Paulson, what I can say to you is um, I've been in this business for 39 years, um, and I've been in uh, two school systems and four different schools, and with maturity, um, that experience is well worth the money that we pay. Um, teachers don't come out of uh, teacher's college um, fully formed and developed. They need a time to be nurtured. They need a time to grow, to become proficient in their craft. Um, we, in a, you know, we have a program where we use veteran teachers who are mentors with our new teachers, mentees, to help that process happened faster. But the traditional pay scale, which is everywhere in Massachusetts currently, um, pays people for the number of years they've been in the district and the number of degrees. Teachers must have a master's degree now after five years to have their license, to retain their license. They have to have the master's degree. So there's another lane that they have to go to because of that. And um, we have always, as many other districts, have paid more as you have more education. So if you have two <laughs> master's degrees with 15 years of experience, then you make more than somebody that has one master's degree. Um, do I believe through a collaborative process between management and labor, um, can there be somewhat of a leveling so that it's more predictable um, the idea that over 11 years, every year it's going to go up because we have, right now, 50% of our staff is within the first 11 years. Um, yeah, it would be nice to reach that quicker and be able to tell you that's the number that we need. And to find ways, and you and I have had a, um, some of our conversations where we've talked about New York City, and I believe you talked about paying certain teachers over a hundred thousand dollars because of the scores of their students because they prove that they produced so I think it's a complicated thing I don't think it lends itself to an easy answer um, but we respect collective bargaining and we will continue to work in a collaborative way with our unions Jeff just to answer Dick's question yes As the country has grappled with how to achieve better educational results, uh, some actually almost sad, certainly disappointing comments have come out of uh, the mouths of educational management people um, and, and others who purport to understand uh, the education profession. Uh, I'm specifically referring to the notion that um, after, and I've heard this multiple times, after a teacher gets uh, professionally certified, they really never get any better. 
So we just might as well hire people who have never been trained as a teacher, who happen to have great grades from an Ivy League school, and they'll do just fine because after all, um, they're really bright college kids. The sad truth, Dick, is that under current management style, if you will, there is too much truth to that in the sense that a professional teacher gets far too little support, encouragement, supervision, accountability, all of the normal things that you would expect to get if you were a professional employee working for a, an outstanding organization. The truth is that experience must matter <coughs> because if it doesn't, then management has failed. And I would contend that the very things that our superintendent wants to achieve with this budget are going to change the very paradigm that you're talking about, which is, oh, pay everybody a lot of money right up front and then don't care if they leave. I don't know a single successful organization of any kind, much less an educational organization, that is successful doing that. And I, don't, I personally don't think Wareham wants to be a part of that, and I look forward to the impact of the management changes we're making to make the life of a teacher in this school system a whole lot more interesting, thrilling, and wanting to be a part of it and to be retained, and we should pay them what that what is worth, what that's worth, and that means that in 10 years, they will be a much better teacher than they are after three. Just, just if I can build on one thing, Dick, and then I want to give it back to the Finance Committee. We, we, we are there's a paradox at work here, you know, there's like a, a conflict um, because it's a flip side of a record. We have had uh, a lot of retirements and we have had uh, some layoffs, but we really have tried to replace retirement teachers with, with younger teachers only because the, for the obvious reason, because we can buy them for cheaper. But that, that plays into a problem in a budget year. And I absolutely agree with you. We should be looking at it in, in a more global, far-reaching perspective. But right now, taking it as a short-term approach, which is next year's budget, the problem with hiring young teachers under the, under the current structure is that not only do you have a negotiated settlement built into their pay raise, you also have built into their pay raise a step system. And the, ses the step system is what, what drives that cost of salary instruction up because the younger the staff, the more steps you have to give them. You had, when, I was, when I left Wareham High School, um, there was a very seasoned staff and most of us were on <laughs> maximum. Well, people would say, well, we were making a lot of money, but what you could do is you could uh, probably approach the budget process a little bit more finitely because there were no steps involved. It was only the negotiated settlement. It's very hard to, um, to factor in lane adjustments based on educational and degrees and so forth and so on. So that's the short term problem. Go ahead, Donna. The only, the only thing that I would, would hope that there's, we all know that there are, there are always, um, in any industry, we have our, our weaker. And I would hope that there's a, there's a mechanism that our children don't fall through the cracks. And we're getting, um, that the teachers are measured, which, as I said, you know, I have not personally mm -hmm. ever seen that, but it's, it's something that we should have. It, they should have a standard that they're expected to. Much make. of this budget presentation is dedicated to just that, D to increasing and improving teaching and learning. Okay. Sure. Yep. Still over there. Dick. Okay, I'll <coughs> there's like a dead horse here, and I'm, I'm going to just try to make one point here. And I happen to, Barry brought up a, a subject that he and I have talked about, and I happen to agree with with Jeff and his on his observation. Um, the point I should have made, and I will now make, is I would pay, I, I am unalterably opposed to uh, just paying people 3% a year more, 3% a year more, whatever it is. Uh, and everybody here on the FinCon certainly knows that. Um, I'm inclined to pay for excellence. And so what I would do, what I would suggest is 
do exactly what I suggested, pay a higher salary for starting teachers, and then to, to uh, Jeff's uh, issue about experienced teachers, somebody's uh, in the fifth year, sixth year, seventh year, and is really talented, and the, the step would get them up to, um, I'll pick a number, $70,000, I'd say, boy, that teacher's so good, 100000 And so that what you do then is you, you, you bring in the young talent, pay them well, and as you go along, you make a judgment as to how good somebody is. And if somebody isn't so good, they get to the, the step, but they get to that lower step, and they leave. And that's unfortunate because you may lose some good people, but I'd rather gravitate towards and take the chance, take the chance of getting some really good people and paying for it. That, that's, that's really my, my interest. Anybody we've, else got one, we've got one more question. Okay. Go ahead. I think I heard you say, Dr. Sylvia, that uh, we have a significant number of unfunded mandates in the state. I want to well, ask they used to be funded. They're not funded any longer. Well, to, to what extent do we have an ongoing pushback from this community that tells the people in Boston, we don't need all of these mandates without your money. Keep your mandates and your money. Because otherwise, we are at the bottom of the funnel, and we all know what happens at the bottom of the funnel. We never push back to the extent that we get pushed down. The problem across the country, as you all know, I read an article in the paper this morning about it, is everything's getting pushed down to the local level. And they're just kicking the ball down the road. And it's ending up right here. And, and it's ending up with this, with this situation that we've got before us, where we've got community needs and mandates that, that we have to meet with, with resources that keep shrinking. And you're absolutely right. The answer is in Boston and in Washington. Uh, and I wish I had more power, but I will say this, that a lot of the professional organizations are working on this. Are we? Do we have a lobbyist in Boston, or do we have somebody who routinely goes up there and tells the Department of Education? Massachusetts, what Massachusetts, we, what we, uh, Association, Massachusetts Association of School Committees is very active in Boston. They have, a, they have an entire arm of that organization that is dedicated to legislature. <laughs> the Superintendents Association. So yeah, I would say yes. Thank you. Yeah, I just, have, I, I just have one. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but coming from a business side, you're asking for an 8% increase. Now, I don't care if it's an 8% increase in payroll, 8% increase in expenditures, capital, or whatever. As a businessman, for that kind of request, the first comment I always had was, what am I going to get? Am I, in fact, going to see MCAS improvements next year? And it is, in fact, a portion... Is there some goal in mind? Or are you going to be back again next year asking for another 8% because scores fell again? Well, the 8% is not predicated solely on scores. The 8% is predicated on strategies and programs that will put in place to make the scores better. But it so also includes interventionists. Yes. Right? It includes taking responsibility away from teachers, saying that if you can't perform an interventionist, we'll take over for you. But that's not exactly what that means. Uh, it's darn close to it, yeah. let's be honest about it. It says that your classroom situation is such you need help. If we're going to put the help in, what are we, in fact, going to hear next year well, at some as point, far as a measurement of right. I can just both, speak, both the school I can just speak for myself and the goals and of the committee? I can just speak for myself and the yes. goals of the school committee because we, it's one of our goals. One of our goals, and this is, this is the underlying goal or the overarching goal, is to reduce the to reduce or to shrink the achievement gap by how much? Well, it's got to be a finite goal, and um, <coughs> right now I would say that if you can substantially um, work on a long-term approach to, to shrinking that goal completely, because ultimately that's the, that's the, that's the ultimate goal. But ha pardon? We have a state goal to shrink it by fifteen percent. So whether we make it or not, a goal is a goal. But that is ultimately That's a state goal. Right. What's our goal? Do we have a goal or do we just 15%. have a philosophy? There's a big difference. Right. So you're Long saying term, so you're saying you only intend to do the state minimum improvement. Well fifteen percent. One year. You said a one year goal. Right. You uh, said the state the state is right. fifteen percent. Ultimately the ultimately number. the goal is to reduce the achievement gap completely. 
Yes, I agree with that, absolutely. And don't get me wrong, I come from, I have an educational degree. I come from an educational background as well. Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm, so I'm not against I, any I, of this. I completely understand right? But as I also said, you know, when you're going to put up that kind of money, you want, you want commitment. I, I couldn't agree more. All right, and somebody else's marker, the state's marker, in my mind, is not adequate. Right. I want to hear it from our school committee and our school administration that we've set a target, we're going to tell our teachers what we want. If we get our intervention list, they'll know what we want, and everybody better produce. Because we can't go back and ask for another 8% next year. It just, you can't justify it. Because our tax levy at 25 is maxed. I understand. All right? We're asking for increases when we have a large number of citizens who have not gotten Social Security increases in two years. We have, our average per capita is 22,000. The state average per capita is 26,000. No wonder they spend more over the minimum than we do. They have more to spend, right? And the Finance Committee, we're facing a very tough reality here. We're looking at, we don't want to deny any child any opportunity. We don't. But we also don't want to have public safety become an issue. We don't want the continuation of the problems that we've had with municipal maintenance as far as trying to keep up with the road work in the town, et cetera. We know that there's a substantial number of capital items coming through, including two new schools that you're talking about. And whatever money that we might be able to get this year to feed to the budget won't be available if we have to go out to get new schools. We have to face reality. And you have to face it long term, you're absolutely right. And the best way to do it is to set goals. Right. Jeff? Let me agree 100% with what you said, Frank. Yeah. I, there is no way that I, as chair of the, of the budget subcommittee, can envision uh, anything close to an 8% increase next year uh, if we're fortunate enough to get a request this year, number one. Number two, I agree completely that this budget is an investment. And if you're going to make an investment, even in education, you should expect a return. And I will not be satisfied if I don't see a significant uh, change in that curve so that it is starting to clearly starting to go towards the state average. Now, is state average a, sen a fairly arbitrary uh, number? Yes, and in fact it's a floating number. And would I really like to be judged on the number of successful adults this school system produces? Yes, although that's pretty hard to track. Uh, but ultimately I agree. It has to be, there has to be a return on investment. We have to be able to demonstrate that, and there is no way we can ask for 8% next year. Okay, we're well going on to the other side. Is uh, Chairman? Oh, Vice Chairman Cruz. Is that my name, Walter? Yeah, I'm having trouble turning. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we all, this is a good show and us all coming here together. It shows that we're trying to work together and we will work together. We're here because of our education that we got. So are we going to shortchange our children? We need to step up and we need to get together as a team and do what's right for our children. That's all I have to say. Tyler Administrator. Oh. I bet they can hear me. <laughs> I have a mother's voice, so... Um, a couple of things that I wanted to ask. First of all, I noticed that we've, we've changed the language. Um, for years, we've been talking about um, just being above the minimum net. And now we've changed the language to we're not hitting state average. And I just want people to be aware. Um, I have three children in, in our school system. I have one at Upper Cape. So, you know, I'm a public school, pro-public schools. Um, but I think we need to be aware that where he ranks 43rd from the bottom in the socioeconomic median income of the state. So when we're talking and we're saying that 266 communities spend above us, well, there are 308 communities that are wealthier than us. So we're actually stepping up more than many communities, um, you know, for the ratio that we do. Um, and I know that we were talking about the foundation formula and that the foundation formula hasn't been updated in 10 or 15 years. And I think uh, Mr. White from the FinCom touched on this, um, that if it hasn't been updated in 10 or 15 years, 
where are the, the lobbyists, where are the arguments to DESE to change that formula? Um, I haven't seen it, and I've heard about that, I've heard that complaint for years now. Um, can, I, can I just give you a brief answer on that one? Absolutely. Um, the Massachusetts School Committee Association has that as a resolution almost yearly right now. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. All right. And that's the thing is that I think that there has to be something, you know, as we're talking about how everything, you're absolutely right, Dr. Sylvia, everything falls, keeps falling down, keeps falling down to the, lo to the local level. Um, <coughs> but when there are things, I mean, I know that like on the town side, we had an issue, and I believe me, I know it's not the same, but if you remember four years ago, the town approved liquor licenses. It failed. We had to bring it back to town meeting because it never went through. We were persistent. We got our state rep involved. We got mm -hmm. our state senator involved. We had our town administrator up there hustling on, 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 uh, um, at the state house, and, and we got it through. And so that, I just think that like, there has to be more done on that side um, instead of just saying, well, the formula's not right, so we're just going to throw the burden again on the taxpayers. Um, and I also, um, I also think that as far as, um, I know that this has been brought up before as far as um, when we're talking about the equity in, uh, or the equality in students. And we, theoretically, it would be wonderful to have the money to um, afford the opportunities to Wareham students that say Lexington or Concord can afford on their students. Um, and that I know has been discussions as far as going to the state and having the state do an equality, you know, uh, an equity or equality in, in uh, services. So I was wondering if that's also something that the Massachusetts Association of School Committees or Massachusetts Association of Superintendents um, or just our own um, school committee and superintendent writing letters to DESE or to various state agencies to try to get those things done. Because I think that those, you know, those are huge. If we're going to compare ourselves to the other communities <laughs> and we're going to say that we can't get there, well, we can't get there because we don't have the money. I mean, that's what it comes down to. When Mr. Andrews shows you that dollar bill, you know, 46% is education here. Now the 4% was the upper Cape vocational or, you know, the outside education. We're at 50%. Um, the increase in this budget you're talking is approximately four million dollars from what we have, uh, or what we, you know what we can afford, which is above um, the minimum. And what I want to know is that on a town level, what do you propose we cut out of that four million dollars on our side? You're talking because we have a finite amount of money. Talking uh, library, council on aging, probably the. <coughs> six and plus another four or five police officers, um, maybe shutting down uh, municipal maintenance or at least limiting it to a couple of people that are just there for emergency calls. And I don't even think with that, we're probably at about two million, if I'm figuring it about right. So we still would have to come up with something. Um, so I, I, I have concerns with that. And, um, and the RTI, um, the intervention thing. I think in theory it's a good idea, but when you look at it, what you're doing is you're adding a layer of middle management. And I can't speak for teachers, but I know that when my oldest daughter started school, I think she had 17 kids in her class. Now they've got 30. And I think that, like I said, I can't speak for teachers, but I would think that if we could, rather than just losing teachers through attrition, and adding classrooms and adding, okay, you have 24 kids this year, next year you get 30 because we've lost a teacher. Rather than having uh, a $90,000 interventionist come in, well, that's what the numbers are, 75 for uh, minor, 90,000 for DECUS, those one positions, I think I'd rather see either maybe eight or 10 paraprofessionals um, or maybe a, a couple of full-time teachers so that we could get maybe third grade and fifth grade, which are the MCAS years, add another teacher to those classes so that we bring our levels down from 30 students to 22 students. 
I think there are things like that that can be done. And I think, I, well, I can only talk for the schools that my kids have gone to, but I think the principals, phenomenal, fantastic. The teachers give more than blood, sweat, and tears. And I think, it, however it's presented, I, I perceive it as the teachers, you're not targeting your kids. They're targeting them. They, you can go into any classroom and the teacher can tell you which kids are struggling on what. The problem is, is getting to them. And I think to bring in a, a, a $90,000 position that will come in um, and, and, and target that one or two kids, I mean, it's very similar to like a Title I. That's what it sounds like to me. And, and a Title I paraprofessional, you are talking $10,000 a year. You can get them to start. And uh, so those are my concerns with that. And um, would you like a response I, I would love a response to any of it, sure. Um, I'm just going to just say a couple of things. Um, number one, um, you're throwing around some numbers that I don't know. I don't know if any $70,000 new manager we're bringing in. Um, that's not what the program it's is about. So where, where you got that information, I haven't got a clue. And I want to know. To my knowledge, there isn't a single class in this system in the elementary level of 30 kids. So if you if there's 30 kids in that classroom, I want to know what school it is and I want to know what classroom. Because to my knowledge, there isn't a classroom in this district for 30 kids in the elementary level. Um, because that has been one of our, our goals to keep class size down. And we work real hard about staffing our schools with that in mind, that, that goal in mind. So I don't know what school it is, uh, but we don't have, to my knowledge, we have no classrooms of 30. Well, if you have, if you have classes at 24 and you, and you decide that you're going to limit a teacher through attrition and you have, you know, I don't know, five classes and you lose one through attrition, how many, how many well, ones do they have that? We have worked real hard to strategize so that didn't happen. Um, and in terms of... Um, the formula, we all know the formula is, 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 is not working. One of the reasons why the formula is not working is based on property values. In, uh, in terms of the state, Wayham is seen as a very wealthy community based on property values. That's why the Chapter 7 formula doesn't work. And th with this, there's been an effort to change that now since I think I've been in education since, the, since every farm went in. Um, the McDuffie Law case to try to change it and, and it hasn't worked yet. So the, the problem is the way they figure Chapter 70, it's not adequate. And uh, in terms of the Volk School, yeah, um, you know, the, you got to factor the Volk School in, but if I recall, the Volk School continually goes to the Board of Selectmen and gets on average 5% a year. So I think that that is something we have to think about. Just, just for the record, they go to town meeting. Well, they do. They, they submit they it to, to town, town meeting, school. town meeting. Ha Town meeting has to, the selectmen are required by law to put warrant articles that are properly get submitted to us. They go They're to required to do that. Both goes to the selectmen first. Mm -hmm. So, um, I understand your point in the four million. I don't know where that came from. So, Jeff? Let me, let me agree with much of what you said, Brenda. Um, I would be totally opposed to 70, 80, $90,000 middle management. Uh, there are no positions like that, and I will check the numbers myself to make sure that something hasn't happened because Rhonda Vigan and myself are on the budget subcommittee, and that's the kind of feedback we want to hear. There are no positions being added uh, with regard to uh, response to intervention or the enhanced supervision that aren't at least 50% teaching. In other words, they're still in the classroom teaching. They are not just hovering above the classroom looking for things okay. to go wrong and being paid a lot of money to do that. But So your comments are well taken. Um, I also agree that it is an unacceptable process for, our, for us to sit here saying give us 28 million and change and cut you know the following town budgets by this amount of money. It just doesn't work and I understand and, and completely agree with that comment. I will tell you that last month I personally lobbied Paul Reveille, the Secretary of Education, because um, I was expecting some really bad news about January 24th when the cherry sheets come out for the first time and the governor's budget is submitted. Um, I'm actually somewhat more optimistic now, but nevertheless, what I said to him and what people need to understand is there is an 
there is an equity gap that has been made worse as a result of tough times between the wealthier towns and the, and the less wealthy towns. And yet, despite that, the Chapter 70 formula says that at least 17.5% of the foundation budget will be supported by Chapter 70, no matter how wealthy the town is. So, and I know some people from Weston, so no matter how much Weston <laughs> chooses to put into their budget, and no matter how wealthy their residents, they're still getting a check from the town, even though the foundation formula says they don't need it. Right. So I said to Paul Reveille, get rid of that floor, that 17% floor. Those tens of millions, and I don't know the exact number, but I know it's millions, of dollars <coughs> could, could be well served by giving them to communities like Wareham. Now the problem, and I know you didn't directly compare it, the problem with, with, uh, with uh, lobbying someone like Paul Reveille is that if it was something unique to Wareham, like, like the liquor licenses, then maybe you got a shot. But the lobbying is literally to change the entire formula for the entire state. And that makes it really difficult, and that's why the superintendents and the school committee organizations and the principal organizations are so critical, because they can speak for the entire state. Okay. Anyone else? Just guys right there. Okay, back to the Board of Selectmen. Oh, sorry. I was like, can I just, I, I just have two things that are specific to that. I'm sorry. <coughs> just, um, to the presentation, um, if, if Dr. Rabinovich, um, there was one thing that you had that employee retirement, you had it fixed at $25,000, and it's been that for the past three years. Is that deferred compensation? Because I know that the retirement, we pay that as an in kind, don't we? Or at least. Yes, it is in kind. It does come out of our net school spending, and yes, it's close to five million dollars. It's not to twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand has to do with um, something known as longevity that teachers have in their contract. And if somebody decides to retire and has not given notice, then it's money that we owe them, and we have to just the way the town has. So just okay. So the, all right, that's so it's the longevity that's what pay. That okay, thousand. and then I'm sorry. And the one last question is that in the private on your presentation in um, the private special ed um, that you had said that the private schools go to the state and on average get um, approved an increase uh, about 7%. That's correct. So why are we putting us up 39.9%? Uh, because we've had a move in um, with somebody that has a placement that's close to $200,000. Okay. 240000 Okay, so the seven percent thing really wasn't. It was a, a was specific, a, a specific thing. Okay, all right. I, well, I have other questions, but I know that my other members want to get to it. So. That's exactly what, thank you. Thank you. Board of Selectmen, anyone? Thank you. Uh, I just, I have a comment. Um, I'll go after her. One of the first things you said that there is over, um, I believe you said 300 schools that earn more money than you <coughs> do in the state. Um, towns. I, towns. Yeah, towns. Um, we're still, I know in the fall, I will be handing in my college applications and I will still be competing with them. Mm -hmm. I'm competing with all the other towns, all the other students, um, whether or not they get more money than we do. So if they have a leg up by getting that money, I will be, I won't be as successful in getting it. So there has to be some compensation so that we can be equal throughout all the towns. Well, uh, and I understand that I can appreciate that, and that's what I was saying, is that there has to be something that is done and pushed on the state level for that equality. But it's also is that, you know, just like everything else in life, if, that, if you're competing with these people, then just, I'm sure you do your volunteer time and you're trying to get, like, you know, uh, on the, you know, honors list and things like that that you're trying to do so that you can stand out, do your extracurricular activities. So there are other things that you can actually do to shine. Whereas with the town, as I'm saying, you know, where are we going to cut four million? 
I mean, that's the bottom line. We only have so much money. So if they're looking for four million, tell us where to cut it. And I realize that. And two additional levels. I need those two additional. And I realize that we need to cut that money somewhere in the budget. I have. I don't know how that works. I realize that you guys do that, but to the students who will. We'll s we're still competing whether we all the other towns within Can we please keep it quiet, please, so we can hear and... I agree, I agree. So while we're we doing might the best be doing we can. for... Jessica, mm -hmm. give me a favor, stand up so everybody yeah. can hear you. So while we may be doing well for budgeting for towns in situations similar to ours, compared to the other state, I realize that we are nowhere near the distance that they are doing, and we are in a disadvantage to them. And I realize I wanted to clarify that while we're doing good for us, compared to the rest of the state, we aren't succeeding as much. Thank you. Uh, back to the board of selectmen. Thank you. <coughs> Jessica's comments actually lead perfectly into mine, and that is that we are talking about our children. And we're talking about educating our children. They are the hope for the future. And while I understand the challenges that the community faces fiscally and the social, economic, and the demographics and all of that, now is the time for us to not talk about why we can't do it or pit Council on Aging against children. Now is the time for us to sit down and collectively sharpen our pencils and figure out how we're going to do it because our kids deserve it. I have a small child getting ready to go to kindergarten and when I see those graphs, on that chart, that's frightening to me. And there are a lot of families in this community that have no other alternative but to send their kids to public schools. If they wanted to send them somewhere else, they can't. And we owe that to those families and those children who have chosen Wareham to be their home. Good schools bring better business, more economic development, it grows the community as a whole, and we have got to be committed to this. We have to sit down and work together and not talk about why we can't, not talk about what we're going to sacrifice, talk about what we're going to do to get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's just wonderful. Please hold any applause. Board of Selectmen. Thank you very much for that, Mrs. Winslow. You're welcome, Mr. Hall. Um, so I guess I'm probably going to be the bad guy in the room. Ah, sorry. Um, listen, we're in the town of Wareham. One town. You have three boards, two boards sitting here that are responsible. You have the Board of Selectmen <coughs> and you have the school committee. None of us are paid. So we're not putting any money in our pocket. We have Mr. Andrews and Dr. Rabinovich, two fine administrators who do the best they can do for the school system and for the town of Wareham. And then you have us, the school committee and the board of selectmen that are elected by you to do the best we can for you. Then there's the real problem. There's only so much money in this system in the town of Wareham. That's it. We can't spend more just because it's nice. This morning, I happened to grab the elevator with our town administrator, and I said, you know, this is a problem. we got to find this money. But if we can't find it, when we all sit down at town meeting, how do we decide whether a sand truck and six maintenance guys to keep the streets clean so cars aren't running into buildings is more important than the presentation you saw Dr. Rabinovich give tonight? All important to the town of Wayham. But the citizens are going to come together at that thing we call town meeting, and they're going to say, well, we, we can't start pitting kids against the town. Let's not even go there with the language. Our kids are very important. Their education is important. But so is that ambulance who picks you up and takes you to the hospital. So is the police who show up at a crime to try to save your life. We have public safety issues. A, as a town. We have people who run our town government. The maintenance department takes care of our streets. They're looking for a contract. They're looking for more people. We're trying to put people in there. Dr. Rabinovich is trying to put new people in the classroom. All very important to the town. So these are real serious decisions that we have to make. And it's not, oh, 
because we we have a new cruiser car, oh, that we're falling apart on school transportation because we didn't buy a new bus. Well, because we have a new teacher doesn't mean that that's more important than the police officers that marked us hired for the town. Because as soon as we make that decision and we say, oh, can't have the police officers, <coughs> we put the, the assistants in the, in the classrooms, right? We've done something good. Everybody's screaming at the Board of Selectmen and Mr. Andrews because he hasn't filled the police department. And as soon as we take away those, those uh, teacher assistants from Dr. Rabinovich and give the police the mark, everybody's screaming at Dr. Rabinovich that we don't care for our kids or their education. Neither one is true. But we only have so much money. And that's what we need to do is sit down and look. And I mentioned to Mr. Andrews this morning on the elevator that, you know what we really need to do is have a presentation like this, not 10 minutes to Mr. Andrews and 10 minutes to Dr. Rabinovich, but put our town up on that screen and let you, the voters and the citizens, decide what you want. Because you're going to vote on this, you're going to vote with Mr. Andrews, and then it's not one side against the other. <coughs> We're all from with him. I don't have kids in the way in the school system. But that doesn't matter to me. Because I do have a small son. Education is very important. So this night, people are going to yell at Dr. Rabinovich. I'm sure that's coming. It's been built up. People are going to yell at Mr. Andrews. That's been happening. But the important part is we're all together in this boat in Wyndham. It's not the school versus the town. That's why I'm glad tonight to see everybody sitting at these tables, and I don't mean to exclude the finance committee, only because you're not elected. <laughs> That's why I didn't put you on that vote. So, you know, we're all trying to make good decisions for the town of Wayne. We're not paid, though. So that's all I want to say, Dr. Rabinovich, and I, and I know that you and, and, and Jeff and Rhonda did a, a, a lot of work on that subcommittee. And I'm not saying that that's more worthy than anything else. All I'm saying is, together, we've got to look at that picture, and maybe it's not a one-year jump that we get six new cruiser cars and five new buses and 15 new teachers. Maybe we do that over a, more of a strategic plan. So maybe we add three this year, two cruisers, and then in 2013 we add four more, and then two more cruisers and that kind of thing. I don't think you can do it all in one year because the money's just not there. And there's only one other way to get money, and I'm not going to use that word in this forum. So I want to thank you for giving me a minute. And I think that to get working together, we can make this happen. I'm just not so sure that we can make it happen in the next 300 days. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, is there any more questions from the board selectmen or <coughs> comments? Okay, I guess we go to the school committee now. Um, I'll just start at my left. <laughs> Ken, any comments? Uh, questions? Yeah, my for first anyone? Finance committee, board My first uh, question is to, uh, to Brenda. Uh, I flunked math for four straight years, so I'm just trying you to. You never had me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. I would, if I had him, I would have flunked eight years. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out where you're getting the $4 million when we're talking uh, about $2 million on, on the budget. You keep throwing out a figure of $4 million. I'm talking the difference between the town administrator's recommended budget and your requested budget. And you get somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 million. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for clearing that up. As far <laughs> and also, um, Selectman Holmes. <laughs> Select woman extra. My apologies. And Steve Holmes, that might have been the, the, the best speech that Mr. Holmes has given since he's been in office. I agree with everything that that he said that uh, we have to we have to put the Hatfields and McCoys aside and work together uh, for the town and and for the students because it doesn't help to. Um, say we can't buy seven new police cruisers when the cruisers are going down the street with bumpers hanging off them, and we also have issues with buses. So uh, I commend you, Steve. That was uh, well put. That we need to work together, all uh, 20 plus people up here. To uh, Mr. Paulson's comment about uh, 
paying teachers less as they go along, that's not going to happen. I, I think anybody would just get up and leave and go to Bourne or Falmouth or, or whatever. I do agree that more money somehow needs to be paid up front because people applying for teachers' jobs see in Wareham the starting salary is uh, 36000 and down the street you can get forty two. I, I would apply for that $42,000 job. So I think, and we are working, so I can't get into it because it's negotiations. We are looking at that chart and trying to find a way to maybe <coughs> spruce up that beginning salary to recruit more teachers. But also, um, if you have teachers that have been here for 10, 15 years and, and they keep improving, I think it is our job as a committee and the superintendent's job and the principals to do everything possible to maintain those teachers because if we have a teacher that is improving, um, I hate like heck to have a teacher that spent 15 years in Wareham and decides I'm going down the street to another school um, to do my last five years because I can make X amount of money. Uh, that doesn't help us because a lot of these uh, teachers have, they've known kids from the beginning to the end. Uh, comments about the dropout rate. Uh, I think Jeff Sweat had made comments before at a meeting that uh, similar to where are they now. Mr. Palladino is working on something to track where our Wayham students are once they leave, whether it's through graduation or a dropout. What are the reasons uh, some of these kids are dropping out? And any pay for performance for teachers, uh, that's tough. That's a really tough situation because the teacher that is uh, doing phys ed is not going to get the same uh, performance as someone that's doing English or, or math or something like that. So that's another thing that really has to be looked at. The, the tough thing is, like Mr. Holmes said, there's so much money that you can drag out of the town and it makes it difficult. Our jobs as school committee members um, for the three years that I've been on the school committee, a lot of times I go home and said, why? <laughs> why am I doing this? Because our hands are tied. There's so much you can do as a, a committee member. Uh, we can't just turn around and tell Dr. Rabinovich, here's $30 million. It would be nice um, if we can do that. But the school committee sets policy and hires the superintendent. Uh, everything else comes under the superintendent's uh, jurisdiction as far as principals, performance, and all of that. And if it's a problem down the road, then it's the school committee's job to address the superintendent. And that's, that's one of the duties that we have. So talks about coming back for another 8%. Um, I say if, if the budget was approved and money was there and there's no performance, uh, thank you, there's no performance, then I have to hold the superintendent accountable because the superintendent is up here. The superintendent is responsible for the school system and to your comments, Frank, is we want to know, all right, we gave you eight, four million, two million dollars and we're still here. Where is the problem? So we have a lot of work to do. I hope these committees uh, get together a lot more times and, and try to come up with the right answers to do the right thing for the kids and for the town of Wareham. I wouldn't leave the town of Wareham uh, for any other town in, uh, in this area. Thank you. Rhonda? Um, just a couple things. I've been um, part of the, the budget um, process uh, since the very beginning. And I think um, when we first I approved the, the uh, $2 million increase, it was because um, this is what was asked from the principal to achieve, um, to lower the, um, or decrease the achievement gap. Um, the, and, it, and it was $2 million, the, the $4 million, we did not know that um, the, the difference in the town budget. Uh, we are all hoping that that is um, based on, on what we're expecting um, from the state and that the state will surprise us and that they will give us more money than what we all originally thought. So the four million hopefully will automatically shrink because the money from the state will come in higher than, than we thought. 
but yes, we are asking um, for an 8% increase. RTI instructional leadership, this was not an idea that came from the superintendent or one member of the, the, uh, uh, the school committee. This came from administrators, principals, teachers. This is what they are saying um, will work as well as um, the data that is out there. RTI is currently being um, instituted at several communities that are similar to ours and the data is there that it does work. Um, and this is what is being asked for um, from our schools uh, to help in that achievement gap. Um, and that's the reason why I supported it and that's the reason why I am supporting um, this increase. Do I feel that um, cuts will just need to be made, of course, uh, that, that's a given because of where we're at today. Um, so I do have to agree um, of the other comments that were made today that we do have to work together and I think one of the things that I'd like to suggest is that immediately after this meeting, uh, because we haven't really had an opportunity to look at the town's budget and to see where things are and I'm not asking at all for a say in any other town budgets or, or town departments and cuts because we agreed from the very beginning that that was not what we were going to do. We were going to say what is needed from the schools. Um, but what I would like to see is for the budget subcommittee, uh, for a couple of members of the finance committee, and for a couple of members of the board of selectmen, as well as the town accountant, as well as the town administrator, to meet um, and to really get into a room and try to hammer some of these things out. Um, again, I do not want a voice in what should happen in other departments, but I believe wholeheartedly that when you come into a room, you should come with your best argument. And whoever comes in with that best argument um, and makes your case, then you need to, um, then the rest of the committee then can come together and support behind that. I do think that we can come to an agreement and would like to see that, um, that group formed right after this um, so we can really come together and, and look at um, where we can make some cuts. Um, the one other thing that I will say is that when we did present this, and the principals had an opportunity to come and speak um, in front of the budget subcommittee, um, the principal, the, fin the um, FinCom was there. Um, we said at the very end of that that um, this was from the principals, the superintendent, from the budget subcommittee, this was our input into it. Um, this is what we think we need. Um, do we think that we're right 100% of the time? Well, Jeff always thinks he is, but I don't. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jeff. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I do think that input is absolutely needed in any budget process, and I'm looking for anybody and everybody to give me ideas on how we can educate our children the best way possible um, and doing it with the funds that are needed. Um, so I, I think that's meaning that I need to stop. Um, so... <laughs> Thanks very much. So I appreciate all the committees coming together today, um, but I would also um, support um, for us to go forward and, and come together as a smaller group and to continue hammering this out. Thank you. Thank you. We need one of those clappers. So when the light goes out, we'll all clap like that yeah. and see if it goes back on. Um, Rachel? I don't have a lot to say that hasn't already been said. Um, other than Brenda? Um, your comment about um, writing to people, Secret Service should show up any time to haul me off because <laughs> I write to everybody. Um, because it, nothing is enough anymore and it just seems we're regulated to death, the state is, is just beats us down without coming, coming up with the funds that, they, that they, they just throw it in our laps and it, it's frustrating. And this to me is just a small amount of what needs to be done. You know, I look at the scores for me, and I see, I see hungry kids. I see uh, the transient community is is the needs for th for those families are is immense, and it's a huge tax on this community. Um, we definitely all need to come together. We all need to find some solutions. You're not going to get good test scores out of hungry kids. It's not going to happen, mm -hmm. and we got a lot of them. So. There's just so much that this town has to do. We do need to keep our streets clean. We do need to keep the ambulance running, the police running. We do need to come together. A and 
it is a frustrating process. The biggest frustration is the constant berating of one another and the constant tearing down and the constant bickering that, this, that happens in this town. Nothing gets accomplished. Nothing gets solved. There's just this constant bitterness and, and that is our biggest problem. We have financial problems, but we can't solve them with the attitude and the atmosphere that is, is running through this town. It, it, we have to come together. We've got to sit down. We've got to look at the needs of this community. Um, we've got to educate our kids. I mean, it, 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 this isn't enough. It's not enough. Our kids in our schools are not getting enough. My kids are in there. I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated when they come and talk to me. Um, but you can't get blood from a stone either. So we do have to come together and come up with some solutions. And we've got to stop the infighting. We've got to stop this, uh, this, this constant tearing down um, and, and, and start just operating as a town. We, we are a laughing stock. We are, people look at us and think that we are just absolutely ridiculous. And we are. You look at the newspaper and it's embarrassing. Um, you know, it's time to it's time to cut that, break it down, sit down, work together, and <coughs> uh, and get the needs of this community taken care of. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I'll leave my numbers guy till last. I just got a few gen a very very brief comments. Um, the numbers guy till last. That's Jeff. Um, Yeah, the, our per capita income is down. We, we probably don't stack up per capita in terms of family income. We've got a very high percentage of single head of households. And we've got a whole list of democra demographic issues. But yet, by the same token, we've got riches in this town that are immeasurable uh, in terms of our natural resources and the togetherness of this town. I'll tell you right now, I've never seen a town that when people are down and out and people need a helping hand, there is no other town like Wareham. Um, so my point is, just because we're a poor town and just because we have poor families doesn't mean that those kids deserve everything we could possibly give them. And this is what it's about. We asked our administrators to come up with a needs budget for one purpose and one purpose only to shrink the achievement gap, to get us to at least state average. Now think about that for a minute, ladies and gentlemen, state average. That's putting the Lowell's and the Lawrence's and New Bedford's and the Fall Rivers in the same mix with the Westerns and the Needham's and the Dedham's and the wherever. Dover's, Sherborne, all of the really rich communities, Weston. <coughs> so the state average is the state average. It's a melting pot. It's, it's, it's average of the state. And we, uh, on the achievement level, are below state average. But we're not nearly below state average, I mean, in, in achievement. But we are way below state average in the amount of money spent on education. You saw the graph. And so, am I saying just throwing money at things is going to help? No. But when we're committed as a school committee to make sure the class size is low, you know, we have to be dedicated that when we need to hire a teacher, we hire a teacher. You saw the graph. The majority of the money being spent in this budget is spent in instruction. And you know, we can talk about all of the peripherals. We can talk about the leaky roof. We can talk about the heating system that doesn't work. We can talk about uh, transportation, whatever. But when it really comes right down to it, there's only three things that really, really matter. And there's three things that we should focus on as a committee and as a community. And, 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 and that is the teaching, the learning, and the assessment. And I'm not just talking about the assessment of the students. I'm talking about the assessment of the teachers. It's all part of the package. That's where our energies fall. And if we concentrate on those areas and we use the resources intelligently, we can shrink that, we can shrink <coughs> that achievement gap and get us at least close to state average. The state average, when you really come down and cut down and think about it, is exactly what it says state average. So I don't know where this budget is going to end up. What's going to happen now is we are going to vote on, on a budget next week. We are going to take the recommendation of the budget subcommittee and 
it may change i don't i don't know i can't speak for the committee but what i what i am going to say is that looking at it from someone who's been in this business the better part of 45 years there's no gravy there there's no gravy this is meat and bones so um, it, it's a sad state of affairs and I agree with Rhonda and I, I'm, I'll be the first one to admit that I don't want to pit anyone against anyone else but my main concern right now is obviously to the taxpayers to their pocketbooks and also to their children and I think that that budget this budget reflects an attempt an attempt because ladies and gentlemen we've never recovered from those below uh, state, uh, state minimum we haven't recovered from that we lost a lot of positions. And yes, we put some positions back at cheaper money. But we lost a lot of positions. And the edge of jobs money created, created a golden opportunity for us, but yet a problem. We were able to hire some teachers, but now they're on the payroll and we have no more federal money to pay for their salary. Can anyone honestly say in their good conscience that we don't need a director of guidance at the high school? So, I think that this budget reflects our best effort and the superintendent's best effort. I think it's, it's relative to be tweaked and it's probably not going to stay in its, this original form, but I don't think that it is so outrageous that it is pie in the sky. I absolutely do not believe that this budget is pie in the sky. Jeff? First, I would like to say that um, as chairman of the budget subcommittee, and I'm sure colleague Rhonda Regan agrees with me. Uh, we would love to hear your questions and comments and that's coming soon. <laughs> and for those of you at home or for those of you reluctant to speak publicly, I would love to hear from you. Emails, telephone calls, whatever. <coughs> the Budget Subcommittee has a responsibility to make a recommendation to the, full so to the full school committee by next week as to what we think uh, the budget should be. Uh, we do not want to do this in a vacuum. Yes, we've studied lots of numbers, and we've studied not only the school budget, but also the proposed town budget. We understand, and I take Selectman Holmes' comments very well, uh, we don't print money here. Uh, we have what we have, and we have to do it, uh, use it wisely. And I do, and I know the rest of the school committee and our superintendent would love to hear from you if you have some thoughts as to how best to spend <coughs> your money. Um, I also want to say that there are no villains in this room and there are no villains at home and the, t and the Wareham taxpayers are certainly not villains. If there is a villain, and I come back to uh, some earlier comments, it's, it's um, the uh, state of Massachusetts. I'm sorry, it's the truth. And if the governor was here, um, I would tell him it's the state of Massachusetts. I think this, this, uh, this state is right to be sued again. Why? Because 1993, when they put in ed reform, it was to avoid a judge coming down hard on them and saying, you're failing the students of towns like Wareham. So they compromised and they put ed reform in, and it worked actually very well for about, well, not quite a decade. Maybe they got it through the 90s when economic times were, were good. But once times got tough, especially by the, about 2004, 2005, well, instead of the tough getting going, they failed us. And that's the truth. A big reason they failed us is because at the same time, from the, for over the last 10 years approximately, they have added about 700 billion, excuse me, million, 700 million to chapter 78 for this state. But at the same time that that 700 million was being added, healthcare costs went up one billion. So we have actually lost 300 million for the education of our children. Well, how did that happen? Very simple. As it was earlier stated, they simply ignored medical inflation and just kept bumping it up about 3% a year. And everybody who gets a paycheck and everybody who pays premiums knows that 3% would be wonderful, but it doesn't happen. In fact, the average over that 10 year period for medical inflation has been 13 plus percent. That explains the billion dollars that we're spending now in education more than the 700 million that was added. So that's the villain. 
I wish I could sit here and tell you there was a solution. But I also agree with my colleague Rhonda Dugan's statement that we need to work together. We need to get people in the room who have been empowered by the taxpayers and the citizens to make some decisions and to show some leadership, uh, not only before town meeting, but at town meeting, so that the taxpayers can feel that people have really studied it and the recommendations have been really thoroughly thought out and we really know what we're talking about. I look forward to that process and mostly I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we've reached the point. <laughs> now we've reached the point in the um, meeting that we'll take public participation. Um, as I, just a second. As I mentioned before, you'll be first, I promise. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, um, we want to keep it civil, so no yelling and screaming. Um, there is a microphone. I would ask you, if you have a question, to go to the microphone, and that is so that you can be picked up by the uh, TV. Also, this microphone down here, we should be verified to be in the audience. We have a problem with the five percent fee. Okay. All right. So, um, all you have to do is raise your hand. I'll try to recognize you. Mr. Rose? Just state your name for the record when you come up. My name is Deborah Rose, and currently I am a volunteer at the Miners Farmer School, a second generation volunteer. My mother preceded me. First of all, Mr. Sylvia, or Dr. Sylvia, I kind of was upset what you said just a few minutes ago. There are those of us in this room, I think there must be some, who are taxpayers who do not have children in the schools but we don't feel bad about paying for them to get a good education. I didn't think I said that, but that's okay. No, you, the way you answered or commented, it came across that way. Secondly, the reason for some hungry children in this school is because parents will not fill out the paperwork <laughs> that requires them to get a free lunch. Second of all, the school committee in May of 2010 asked for volunteers from the general public. I sent an email to Dr. Sylvia. That is eight months ago. I have never been contacted except Dr. Sylvia sends back to me that he is working <coughs> on it. He has given the name to somebody. Also, we have a mutual friend who has spoken to Dr. Sylvia and indicated how upset I am about this. I am not a native to this town. I am an adopted native. I did not go to school here. That was my parents' choice. We own property here, but they did not want me to go to school here because of a family situation. I want to know why you don't want community involvement. Is it a select group? Do you have to belong to a certain religion to get involved? I don't think so. I have recommended you to a certain committee and uh, I don't know how active that committee has been at this point in time, but all I can do is say I'll look into it. Well, because I'm disgusted with another board that's... Wait a minute, let me finish. Me. It's another board that is at this meeting. You're very angry at me. Not at you, at okay. another board that's at this meeting. All right. So much so that I have made a decision I will be moving from the town of Wareham. Well, that would be unfortunate. You have been recommended, I will tell you now, that this really has nothing to do with the budget, but you have been recommended for participation as a citizen on the Community Relations Committee. So that's all I can say. And you promised that I would be contacted again after the but holidays. But I don't know how active at this point in time no, that committee I can, has I, been. Dr. Sylvia, I can, I can speak to that. Okay. The Community Relations Committee, Dr. Sylvia put me in charge of um, heading up the Community Relations Committee. Um, the first order of business was working with administration to um, uh, roll out the new school improvement plans. That work was done at the end of last year. Going into this year, it is my responsibility <coughs> to communicate out to each person um, that has been recommended that the Community Relations Committee will start um, this quarter. I'm sorry they don't have an exact date but I'm in the process of sending an email to each one of the principals asking for citizens or um, parents 
but Dr. Sylvia did give me um, your information and that you will be um, invited to that Community Relations Committee. I'm sorry that it hasn't started yet. Well, he has sent you the messages because I know he has because he CC'd you on my email okay. and you haven't had the decency to contact me to even explain what okay, you just we, did tonight. We have Wait to a minute, and one more on. thing. Okay, go, but we have to Unless on. there's improvement by the school committee, I'm not voting for anybody when they come up to run. <laughs> Anything on the budget, please? Can we just can, keep can it to I the budget? To yes, that? go ahead. Um, one response is I, you said hungry students because they don't fill out the forms. I, I think the, the comment of hungry students is students were hungry to learn more. I'm not sure it was related to food because in the school system, nobody goes unfed. I believe that's that's what Anything else to be said on the budget? Yes. Could you please come up and state your name? Either place. Yes, my name is Donna Ashley. Hi, Donna. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I did, I'm not a, a parent of a child in the Wayham schools right now. I did. I had my son who went from K through 12 in Wayham school system. And he's a credit to the system. He is a credit to the system and a credit to his mother, too. But that's another, and I'm embarrassing him right now. <laughs> um, but I just want to say that, you know, for involvement, um, even though I'm not a parent at this time, I take it very, very seriously and I'm very lucky and blessed to be able to serve um, the, school, the school in the town of Wareham. Um, presently on the Wareham High School School Council still, even though he graduated two years ago as a community member, uh, and that's a privilege in this town. The reason it's a privilege is because the town has worked under very difficult, difficult budget situations for many years. Um, I've been at many school committee meetings. I've been at many town meetings. Um, and I, I want to commend the school committee on this budget, and I know it was difficult, and I know that it's hard um, for taxpayers. We all pay taxes in this town. We love this town, and, and I agree with what um, the school committee member said. There's no town I would rather live or would live in but Wareham. Um, I want to commend all of the board members that are here for their willingness to work together. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, <laughs> Emily, uh, the school department has been more than willing, and I think if more parents were willing and more community members were willing to get involved, they would have more of the help that they need. Um, I'm now retired and, and have all kinds of time, and I'm more than willing to, to help out any of you um, in any, any capacity I can do and, and serve in. Uh, but I, I, I agree also with your member who spoke on the diversity in this town. We need to come together once and for all. We come together when there are tragic things that just happened this week. Yes, we do. People will be coming together in love and in unity. And unfortunately, in the past few years, we've had seven young people seven students of the class of 2009 and 2010 that have passed away already by accident or by other situations and that's a heartbreak but I'll tell you the school committee the school members the principals the administration when you go to these times and when you support these times they're right there too and that's the good part even though we're a government and a town government that that may disagree at times we also love our town and we love our people. And when someone hurts, they hurt. The young people in the past two years have seen so much of this, but they've had good education. I could not have raised my son in a better school system than Wareham School Systems had I been able to afford to put him in public schools. And I want to commend the school committee on this budget presentation. I know how difficult it was. 
and I don't know if Dr. Rabinovich is going to get hollered at by other people in town, mm -hmm. but I want to say to you, Dr. Rabinovich, thank you for the hard work that you have done in the past, not just the past few years you've been school committee chairman, uh, just superintendent of schools, but mm -hmm. the, I was up all night with a sick chihuahua last night, I'm tired, <laughs> but also in the number of years that this man has served in Wareham. When my son was started in the middle school, it was when the middle school, the first year of the middle school was being renovated. And the principal of that school that year was Dr. Rabinovich. And he couldn't have had a better man to be under that has continued to start his adult life. So I want to commend each and every one of you on the school committee. I want to commend Dr. Rabinovich and commend this budget. And I want to assure you of my support. Um, I just also finished in serving on a committee with Mr. Luzon on the uh, bullying um, situation. And I will probably be on school council until I'm there in a cane. <laughs> well, hope that's a long time. But, you know, I, I don't see myself leaving there in case I get kicked off. And I, can't seem to be happy and I can't seem to get fired from the job. Thank you. I want to commend you all, and I want to let you know that, you know, you have my support here and at town meeting. Thank you very much. And I much. do commend the selectmen. I know you've got a rough job, and I, I do my best to support this town in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Questions or comments? Please identify yourself. Bob Brusso. Uh, it's all set. Is it, is it all set? It's on? My name is Bob Brusso. I think most of you know that until April, I had served 15 years on the school committee and also 34 years as an educator in this community. I guess I would like to start this evening by asking all of us in here to give a round of applause to these people who are elected or appointed for the job that they do on our behalf, and they take so much criticism, and I want to say thank you very much. That is not done often enough. We have a tendency to yell at each other, to criticize, to tear down instead of to build up. And I've been in this community since 1960. And I can probably say probably a lot has changed and a lot has not changed. And the part that has not changed is that Wareham never has been a wealthy community. And unfortunately, it comes back to haunt us at times like this when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is looking at possibly, the governor says, a $2 billion structural deficit in the state budget. The rubber is going to hit the road someplace, be it in local aid for the community, be it in Chapter 70, we are going to be hurting. However, I'd like to hit some good news. I don't know if you people have listened the last three or four years, Massachusetts school children, grades four and eight, on the National Assessment of Educational Pro Progress are number one in the country in both math and English, our students. You've seen these figures here tonight. We are going up, but there is a gap. The gap is caused because Wareham is not as wealthy a community. And Massachusetts, on the, on the international test, our students last year performed number one in math and language arts. I'm not making those figures up. They were announced on all of the national programs. You can see that and you can hear it yourself. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a problem here. We're dealing with our own structural deficit. I hope it's not four and a half million dollars because if it is, members of the board and citizens of this town, we are going to devastate this community. We can't allow that to happen. Our problem is that Massachusetts is the third wealthiest state in the country. Our tax system is terrible as to how we fund public services. You and I can't, so can't change that here. We're not going to change it. It's going to have to take place at the state level. But all I do, do know is that we have got to work together. I just want to throw one thing out. In 1980, I was here when Prop 2 and a half passed. Those first two or three years, let me tell you, it was unbelievable. Over half the teachers in the school system every April got pink slips. We didn't know who was going to survive. There were rallies in Boston. A lot of you were here. 
the pink slips that were flying. We did not have the money. What was going to happen in Wareham? You know, there were some public-minded citizens. They created an ad hoc committee made up of two members of the Board of Selectmen, two members of the school committee, and two members of the FinCom, if my memory serves me correctly. They sat down with that budget mess. They came to agreements upon themselves, and they came to town meeting with that ad hoc report, and you know, the town meeting went with it and passed it. And that went on for a couple of years, and then the process disappeared. Maybe we're at that stage again when an ad hoc committee of people from these boards have got to get together and work together to deal with the issues we're dealing with. But we can't continuously shortchange our children because that gap is going to continue because we are not a wealthy community. We don't have the money, and the state recognizes that also. We do work with our state legislators. And I've, the 15 years I was on that school committee, I can't tell you how many times every year I went to Boston for the school committee association, sat in Susan Williams Gifford's office, in Mark Pacheco's office, sent letters, called the governor's office on these things in terms of funding. I can't do it alone. You need a chorus of, of 12, 13,000 people in this community. You know, there was, a, there was a, an organizer with farmers back at 100 years ago who said, the problem in America with the farmers is that instead of raising more corn, they should raise more hell. And probably that's what we have to do as a community, but we've got to work together. But let's not attack each other. Let's work together with these people. I know we can solve the problem, but I hope it isn't a $4.5 million problem on the school side because we will never, ever recover from that. Anyone else would like, thank you, Mr. Busso. Anyone else would like to address the committee? Yes, sir, thank you, Rupert. Mm -hmm. Claire Smith. Good evening. Um, <coughs> as difficult a time as we've had over the years with budgets and budget cuts, I don't want people to leave here tonight and short sell the community and the education that we've given our children. I've had the privilege for the last 19 years to sit on three different scholarship committees. It's now scholarship application time. This, the applications are coming in. I have the privilege of looking to see what schools these children are applying to, what schools they're being accepted at, the packages that they are being offered because of their academic grades. We are sending children from Wayham who are being accepted to and are succeeding at Colby, at Dartmouth, at Brown, UConn, uh, BU, MIT, Worcester Polytech. Uh, we are doing a good job at educating our students and they are succeeding. In addition to that, as a, as a member of the Wayham High School Alumni Association, I am in constant contact with graduates of Wayham High School who have moved all across the country and all across the world who have become very successful. Top government leaders, uh, one of the Wayham graduates uh, was in charge of one of the programs that distributed aid all across every country in the world. So even with our shortfalls in our budget, <coughs> with the issues that we have trying to work it out in educating our students, I want you to leave here tonight knowing we are doing a good job, our kids are getting a good education, and they are being competitive with people from Newton, Wellesley, and all of the wealthy towns. They are succeeding. We have a young man over here I found out last week. He's made the dean's list. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's what we're producing uh, from this community, even though we have budget issues. So I thank you for your efforts. I thank you for your attention to the curriculum. It is paying off, and the students are doing well. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Um, anyone else want to address? Yes, please come forward. State your name for the record. Hi, my name is Ellen Begley. Um, first, an observation. It's awesome to see people want, wanting, rather than coming and being contentious, and being in opposition that I've heard a lot of positive um, comments here about coming to the table and actually negotiating. Um, that's one observation. And I have a question. 
I see the budget with expenditures, and my question is, is the only revenue available to the school department from the state and from the town, or cause I found it very helpful to see the, the disbursement and the income on the town side, and I wonder if that's something that could be presented to us <coughs> from the school department. Does that $28 million include all grant funding and other fun fundings available? To answer it, yeah. no, it doesn't, because that's um, not part of next school spending. Mm -hmm. So the budget that gets approved at uh, town meeting is just for next school spending, and you are correct. What makes that up is just state revenue and from the town, local contribution. I think you're asking a different question, and it's one with which I have a great deal of sympathy. Um, on the budget subcommittee, we are actually working to put together a document that would exactly do what you're saying, which is, okay, we know where all the expenses are. Now, tell me what revenue beyond the town contribution is supporting all mm -hmm. those expenses. Believe it or not, it's a, it's a more difficult process than you would think, but we're getting there. We're very close. Um, uh, just to give you a sense of the differences between the numbers that you see on town meeting floor, there's about six million dollars that you never see mm -hmm. that is embedded in other town expenses that is called in kind. But what, when most of that is the health insurance for the school employees. So that so you could take whatever number you see at town meeting and then you could add another say six million, which is mostly health care. Mm -hmm. Then on top and I'm gonna look at my notes because it's it's a, as I said it's a new document. Then and I don't have all these from from Obviously, some of these would be projected, but if we look at last year, we had another approximately three and a half million dollars worth of grants. Some of them are what's called entitlement grants. Mm -hmm. Some are competitive grants. The unfortunate part about grants is they almost always have ex almost exactly the same amount of spending associated with them as revenue. In other words, they don't help us with the rest of the budget. Mm -hmm. But it is still three and a half million of added value to the town. Then we have two main, well, we have one relevant non-net revolving fund, which is transportation. And that, fortunately, has produced a significant amount of money to support the transportation department, but it can only be used for transportation. And I'm told by our new transportation manager that seems to be going along fine, and we should be able to provide some support to the town from that. Not a lot, and it can only go to transportation. Then the other major <coughs> revolver we have is something called school choice, which is uh, for every child that comes here, as opposed to their mm -hmm. town where they're a resident, versus the, the children that decide to go somewhere else, the net of that has almost always been a positive. And that money can support the entire, any part of the budget. That's the good news. How much is that worth? Well, Barry, Sixty grand right now. It, it's less than $100,000. It's not insignificant, but it doesn't exactly solve a budget problem. And then occasionally you get other grants that don't have strings attached. Bottom line is, sometime over the next week, I hope to have exactly what you're talking about crunched, except that some of it, of course, will be projections and estimates because we're talking about another six months before the year even begins. But that would be something that would, I think, would be helpful to everybody in the town because Sometimes um, it's easy to have a chicken, chicken little response to, like we're, we're talking, is it going to be a $2 million difference? Is it a $4 million difference? Is it a, it's, if, if it's several $60,000 grants that can impact the budget, then, you know, we, I don't want anybody to go into a panic mode thinking we're going to lose police officers or we're going to lose um, educating our children. I think that all of you, everyone that's sitting here has a little bit more information than the rest of us do have. So as opposed to being reactive, I'm hoping that we could be proactive and get out as much information as possible to all of us so we can really make an informed decision. The kind of transparency you're talking about, I applaud. I agree with 100%. I don't want you or anybody else at home or in the, or in the auditorium to think that at the moment it looks like it's going to help us a whole lot. It's going to help Rhonda and myself feel comfortable about the entire big picture, but it doesn't seem like it's going to help fill million dollar budget gaps. That's, that's the way it looks right now. 
Thank you. Anyone else like to address? Anyone? Step yes. Step, back. Step forward. <coughs> Identify yourself for the record. My name is Michael Collins. I'm a resident of Wareham. I teach at the high school. 25 years ago, I ran for selectman in this town. I lost by a very slim margin. Mm -hmm. In my campaign, I suggested something. It's a question for the board of selectmen, the town administrator. Why has the tax rate in this town not been classified? We have a car town out in West Wareham. We have two industrial parks. We have strips that are developed to the max. Most of us pay more property taxes than McDonald's out on the highway. I know you can't answer that question, but why hasn't it been considered? Maybe additional revenue can be drawn for the community from the businesses that are making millions on its citizens. Thank you. taxpayers, uh, which is something that to look forward in the future, but it won't change the bottom line. We're going to bring in $760,000 in change off the 2.5% two, two uh, levy limit and another $200,000 in new growth. Um, I would take your question one step further and try to feed into when, when we get to a point where we can close the gap, are we producing workers that are going to stay in this town, buy homes, work in our uh, commercial industrial facilities and, and be the workforce of tomorrow. That's really where this is all going. When people graduate, to the moderator's point earlier, uh, can we keep those individuals that, that will be graduating, going to college and staying in the town is really a challenge for many cities and towns in the Commonwealth. But the bottom line is, is that you have a number that's finite. It's two and one half percent that you can, ch you can uh, uh, go to classification. It's not going to change the bottom line. Thank you. There Welcome. was someone in the back that wanted to speak. Come on up. <coughs> Please identify yourself for the record. Okay. Um, I do have four children in the town. Two are in the um, school systems at this point. Um, I just wanted to ask a question of what exactly is a rainy day fund? Because we're talking about cutting things that are essential and are not. And in our household, rainy day fund is for ice creams and you know <laughs> day trips. So I'm just wondering why we're talking about having to pit cars against you know educators as opposed to you know street workers, and we have a rainy day fund. So that was just all I had for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. <coughs> the rainy day fund is a stabilization fund that helps the town improve its uh, fiscal stability over time. At one time, we had close to $2 million in that rainy day fund, and it was stripped out over the past decade or so, sometime in that period of time, to just about zero. <coughs> what that says to the rating agencies when we go to borrow money is that we don't have any money in reserve to cover any unforeseen issues that might come up in the town. So the way you put it back in to improve your fiscal stability is the plan that we have. The financial management plan is to put it back in incrementally um, and to improve our fiscal stability over time so that we're going we're to buy money going forward for whatever it might be. It could be part of the, I see the, the School Building Assistance Authority application here, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, it's going to take dollars to get that going. And I'm a big advocate to get as much as we can from the state to the Mass School Building Authority and been working with the superintendent and, and the board of selectmen and the school committee on that. So it does improve our, our ability to make sure that we can have something in reserve in case there is something that happens and maybe we shouldn't use rainy day fund. Um, you could call it the court of last resort where you can go to get money to be able to solve a very difficult fiscal situation. It's up to the uh, board of selectmen and it's also up to the town meeting members to vote this in uh, the budget in, in April 
and I would ask you to come forward. If you don't think we should put $150,000 aside, then we'll move forward in a different direction. But I think it's fiscally prudent to do that, to replenish this account, and I believe the Finance Committee has already endorsed this concept uh, in the years past, uh, and I'm welcome to any suggestions that you might have going forward. Thank you. All right, one more question, please. Oh, maybe not. At this point in time, uh, I'm going to uh, suspend the public hearing. Uh, we do have one piece of business that we have to take care of. Uh, these folks are more willing to, to stay because it, it's, uh, it is a, uh, a, a an interest statement to uh, renovate. I am suspended, okay, suspended is the wrong word. Yeah. I c now close the public hearing. Thank you. Oh, cool. um, I would like to, uh, just for the record, I'll have uh, Dr. Rabinovich uh, speak to it more specifically. Uh, or, or are you are speaking to, to it? Do it in a oh, go ahead. Come okay, on up. Um, we, are, we are now proposing, uh, and we need the approval of the Board of Selectmen on this, to apply to the state... Uh, our interest application for uh, uh, construction and renovation at the Minot Forest School. And so um, Anna Miranda will, will present the um, facts to the Board of Selectmen. Okay. And uh, if there are any questions, you can either ask me and I won't know the answer or Anna Miranda. I'll know the answer. Go ahead. Um, in November 2009, we came. We've got a lot of people leaving. Really, thank, yep. everybody. thank everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. We know it was a long night. I really appreciate you being here. And I also think it's important to, you know, just one other thing, just to be able to um, thank again all the board members for coming today, um, for speaking, um, for asking their questions, and I think that we all do look forward to continuing to work together. So okay. just to add on, thank everyone. I didn't think anybody feels legal, but that's okay. That's very good. Thank you. And I thank everyone also. Um, it's been a long evening, and it's a long process. So thank you again, everyone. Anna? Okay, in, in 2009, November, both of the boards, Board of Selectmen as well as the school committee, um, endorsed the submission of the applications for the Mass School Building Assistance um, Authority. We've selected mine. It is the priority school at this time because of just the, in terms of the needs. The MSBA, the Mass School Building Assistance Authority, from 2009 all the way up to this current election, intentionally chose not to process any applications. A couple of reasons given to us was, one, the uh, waiting for the election to see what the political climate was going to be like, and two, the economy and trying to figure it out. We received notice in um, October that they wanted every district that had submitted an application to do what's called refresh, add any additional information, anything that could be new. Um, the only thing that myself and uh, Principal Siemens um, added for the MINA is that we do have more concerns over the electrical system, you know, in terms of the, the infrastructure, and we, wanted, we highlighted that in this application. Um, they require an actual um, official vote. So I did, Michelle, do you have those copies? You passed them over. Okay. Um, it, it has to be, uh, basically I need to uh, uh, get two signatures. You'll find that there's two documents. One says specifically school committee. It's the vote of the school committee. And then the second uh, form says the vote of the Board of Selectmen. And then there is a third form that requires all three signatures on one form that I will need to get from you. The vote, if you'd like, I think the most efficient way to do it is that it does have to be a, a recorded formal vote. I'd like to uh, propose this motion for both boards and then you can respectively um, vote. Um, if you have any questions before then. Uh, Mr. Holmes? And, and just uh, following your uh, this document, are you referring to page 28 uh, for the form of the vote? 
Is that, is that the motion that you need is on 28 and 29? Yes, 28. This is the, the selected, this is the recommended language for this vote. I have taken this language and actually put it into these two documents, Mr. Holmes. I'm trying to find that. I can't this see what that is. The front page. This is the right yeah, front these two page. Is the cover letter on the front page? Yes. The motion. Are the, is yep. the actual motion and how it needs to be um, read and voted in. Okay. I thought we had approved this. To the record. Yeah. But it has here on page two that the submission date was 1-13-2011. So no, has this been submitted or is this just like that you had to put it in? I can't submit. That's the last date that I put any information into the system. This cannot be officially submitted okay. until we get these votes. These, these are, this is the same really process so then vote that um, if you recall myself, Principal Stevens and uh, the Principal of the Deacons went before the Board of Selectmen and you know, received the signature, did the same thing with the school board as well. So they're actually asking us to basically refresh and resubmit the application with the um, signatures of the current boards as well. Jeff. Does the approval of this motion in any way uh, cause any funds to be spent? No. 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 Not at this time, no. Fine. No. Okay. No. If they no. Approve our application, yeah. then we have to come before the town and ask for money for a feasibility study. Okay. If we if we respond, can we just try to be loud because the board of selectmen has to hear it too. Yeah. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? I haven't heard part of the response. The question was whether or not by uh, voting to accept this, whether we're committing any money. Right. And the answer was no, we are not committing any money because this is just asking for them to approve our application. If they approve the application, then we have to come back to the town because they would then require us to do a feasibility study. That's the money that would have to the non talk to them, uh, that we would have to go for. And that takes a vote of town meeting. So basically, Dr. Romanovich, this is just to get the application. That's right. Submit it for the state so that we can try to get it. Correct. Thank you. To be considered. Right. To be selected, it really. Is. If this is a, yeah, you submit the application to be considered to be brought, to be selected as a project. Yes, sir. Mr. Paulson. No, was it on that? Just to be clear about this, I understand submission of the paperwork, but there is a figure that I heard at the meeting the other day as to what the cost of the uh, feasibility study might be. And I think before people go out of here, they really ought to understand that because you might think, well, there's no cost because that's what you heard at this meeting. But the figure I heard for the feasibility study was? Currently about $500,000 to do a feasibility no. study for a school building renovation and expansion. Um, and again, as Dr. Rabinovich did state, if we are, and again, if, you know, if we are approved and brought into that, um, that, that cycle of approved applications, that would be the time that then we would go through, you know, um, the formal process of coming before the town and, and looking for the funds for the feasibility. One quick observation is Bob, uh, Bob White's uh, point earlier on about lobbying in Boston. All you have to do is walk through the school, or both schools, and, and you don't need a half million dollar feasibility study. Who are we kidding? Why, yeah. do, we, why do we put on He's our right. Well, they, they've heard that from us, <laughs> believe me. We agree with you. Those are the rules. The requirement. Dick, Dick, are you have these to rules. Do it for 300? Let's <laughs> <laughs> just keep giving in all. No. Okay. Do we uh, have a board of selectmen? So, okay, Do we have a board of selectmen? Um, if they have any questions or mm -hmm. comments, or do they have to meet amongst themselves? Chairman Cruz. They were asking if. if Dr. Sylvia, could you repeat it, please? Yeah, my question is, I want to put it on you guys now. So do you need more time to talk about this? Or, well, that, that's or do what you I need just any, any other questions answered? 
Well, I would say, well, that's what so I was just saying to them because it's this getting is too confusing. First, so why don't I mean, we just deal with you guys? Case. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying to them that this is the first time. I mean, I know that I know we had voted and everything, but and I know that um, Sham and Donahue um, from vacation put this on our agenda. But this is the first time that we've seen this. This is given to us tonight. So I was trying to just try to read and see what you know what changes, if anything, were were made from. The, last time the, we the, the only the here. only change, Mrs. Ekstrom, was we highlighted we do we having we had to uh, basically cap off um, an electrical outlet in each of the classrooms at the mine at Forest because at the time when they were built they were over sinks, um, and so basically those teachers are working with one less electrical outlet even though all the technology and the demands of you know instructional teaching has increased and you need more of that. Yeah, you know, and then and again, you know, relocated classes at Hammond, uh, one additional class, um, the T1, and then another two first grades at the end this year. So th really, that's the only the real differences in the application from the first time that we came before the board. And and I believe Michelle Ruiz had uh, emailed the. Uh, the to full the application, chair. like to the chair. Yeah, to the chair. So we, we had assumed that you would have gotten it, you know, last week and would have had time to um, have previewed it. And a quick question: um, Can the vote? Can you move the question? I just want to do the And it's probably a question that they'll ask. Oh, all right, go ahead. Good. Yeah, open them up. Go ahead. Um, whether this, um, the vote of the board of selectmen could wait until their next meeting? Um, or what, what are the reasons why? Um, the, the deadline for actually doing the actual sub physical submission in the system is the, I want to say January 26th. January 26th. So you could. Like so for example, they if this meeting had not been planned, I would have been. Uh, going to the board of selectmen to say, well, either last week or this okay. week's meeting, right, so can we come in front of you? Absolutely, but it, it seems like that they haven't had a chance to take a look at it. So could uh, could we consider that the vote of the school committee happens tonight, and that since the board of selectmen are meeting on the 25th, that we ask that this is put on their agenda and the vote is taken that night? Could that happen? Absolutely. Fine with me. Although really nothing has really changed from but the last still, process. Still, I mean, yeah. just yeah. like if, if I got yeah. something for the first right. time, I would want to yeah. read it over yeah. if I was going to be taking a vote on it. So since there is a meeting on the 25th, the day before. Again, let, let the board of selectmen decide for themselves what they want to do. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to get that information. We call the meeting, just go to the Senate, because all we need is three. One member that already left. Okay, before they're thinking, we could read the motion as it is for the school committee to vote. Read the motion for the school committee. Mm -hmm. The 500000 that would be bonded. It would end up being a part of the overall project, and it would not show up as an expense for the FY12 budget. Is that an accurate statement? I do not believe so. Now with the changes, they do not consider the feasibility portion of the study part <coughs> of the project. That's a major change that happened in do not. MSBA. Do not. So it can be bonded, but where, where would it show up in our budget? It, it, it isn't in it, our budget. It would have to, have to come. To to town it would have to go budget. before town Seven meeting. Articles. Yes. Okay. Would that end up being a part of the FY12 budget? No, I don't believe so. It doesn't calculate the extra spending. It's a well, more than the Thank you. 
Okay. Um, the, the recommended motion for the school committee is having convened in an open meeting on January 19, 2011, the school committee of the town of Wareham, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated January 2011 for the Minot Forest Elementary School located at 63 Minot Avenue. Um, this describes the, which, and then they go into the following deficiencies. We're looking at replacement, renovation, moder modernization, elimination of existing severe overcrowding, replacement or, of, or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide a full range of programs, prevention of severe overcrowding, replacement or renovation of a building which is structurally unsound or otherwise in a condition seriously jeopardizing um, the educational process. Those are the, the actual bulleted items in the statement of interest. The last paragraph basically, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Mass Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the Town of Wareham School District to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Any that is the motion. So moved. All right, do I hear a second? Second. Any more discussion? Seeing just discussion, a committee vote. all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Five zero zero. Yep. That's school committee. That's it was just our vote. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, all right. Do you want to add so, your motion? So I'll read it. No, if you want her to read it, you can. No, you can. If you want to read it, go ahead. I have no problem with coming next Tuesday night. So no, no, no. no. Well, I was going to say. No, no. Um, okay, having convened in an open meeting on January 19th, the Wareham Board of Selectmen for the Town of Wareham, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, I voted to authorize the superintendent <coughs> to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated January 2011 for the Minot Forest Elementary School located at 63 Minot Ave, Wareham, Mass., which describes the following deficiencies and priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future, as stated below. And hereby further spec uh, specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or, com uh, or commits the town of the town of Wareham School District to filing an application for funding within the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Second. So moved. Second. All there? Aye. Motion made second. All in favor? Aye. Three. All, all opposed? Zero. 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 Oh, he kept saying, he kept saying, so moved, and I'm like, no, she said, 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 so three, all right, three zero zero, and then it's just, we need one more.